Uh, okay. And I'll just start the recording, so go, go ahead. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so let's just start. Let's see if I can share my screen. So let's start with the New York Times here. This is the front page or the web, New York Times website. And I just thought I would show this inflation chart because it's such a it's such a typical way of looking at inflation, right? It's it's an average change in price. So this is the consumer price index since uh, late 60s. And th this is basically when people talk about inflation, this is what you get. You get an average. And um, there's nothing necessarily wrong with averages, right? It's just a it's it's just a mathematical definition, but it hides a lot of what's going on. So clearly inflation is high, but that hides a lot of the details, right? So let's look now. So uh, I'm just going to now show you five or six charts that were originally the analysis was from my blog post back in the fall called The Truth About Inflation. And last week I just updated the numbers. So uh, let's start with just the, the consumer price index since January 2020 when uh, the pandemic first started. So we had some deflation in 2020 and then really nothing special until January 2021 and then uh, prices really started going up, the average price, to the point where today, or I guess this is the last month of data is March 2022, where the, the CPI is up 12% from January 2020, which is a lot. Um, and, and this is really, all you get in the in the mainstream media. The problem with this um, this way of looking at inflation is that you kind of assume that it's uniform, uh, but it's actually not. Um, so this is what happens when we zoom out and look at all the commodities tracked by the consumer price index. So now the black line is the average from this chart, but we've had to zoom out so much that the change is 12% from January 2021, but it looks very small uh, compared to the scale of the change for all commodities. So some interesting trends here, right? Like when the pandemic first started, if you remember, nobody was driving. Uh, there were like no cars in the highway, it was just crazy. The price of gasoline dropped a lot. And then this, if we track this, this is gasoline now today. So. Um, there's a lot of reasons for this. Um, obviously, we have a war going on in uh, Ukraine, uh, but we can talk about that. So just a huge change. And this is very typical of oil, gasoline. It's one of the most volatile commodities. Um, so just all over the map here in the last two years. Um, used vehicles, still very expensive. Um, but in general, I want, what I want to point out is the scale of the um, dispersion in price change. So the average price change since 2020 is 12%, but the dispersion, so the standard deviation is 17%. So the standard deviation is greater than the average change, which means that reporting the average, and this is what I was trying to, to kind of drive home in that, the blog post is that the average is not very informative. There's nothing wrong with it per se. You can quibble about the way it's weighted and you'll see a lot of articles about that go into the details about how it's weighted. It's very political and you can quibble about that but you can't really say there's anything wrong with it. It's just an average but it's not very informative when prices are all over the map like this. Um, here's another way of looking at this data. I've lumped now the price change since, so from January 2020 to April 2022, um, I've lumped the price change across different commodities. So something like education, there's really, there's really no inflation to speak of. 
Um, whereas um, here's energy up here, transportation, just like 30% inflation over two years. So this huge variation in commodities. So what frustrates me, now obviously this takes some more savvy to understand this kind of um, analysis. You're not gonna see it in a newspaper probably. But what frustrates me is that for the most part, you just never see this when people start talking about inflation. Um, and it seems to me to be really important because then you start asking like, why are certain sectors able to raise their prices faster than others? And I think that's an important question. Uh, so here then, this is the big uh, century long picture of inflation in the United States. This is the annual change in the consumer price index since 1910, I think. Uh, so we have bouts of inflation during each war, war, World War I, World War II, and then the inflation in the 1970s and 80s. Since then, it's been relatively calm. You don't see a big spike here just because um, we don't have the annual data yet for 2021. So when that's, we get the annual year over year change for 2021, um, we expect to see a big spike here, like we saw in the New York Times article or picture but what so this is basically what the new york times is showing what they never show is this chart which plots the the now the shaded region is the range of price change for all the commodities so you can see that there's this enormous just enormous range so here what's interesting is you can see with every kind of bout of inflation what happens is that the um dispersion in price change kind of explodes. You can see that with the inflation of the 80s, 70s and 80s, um, enormous dispersion. And we're starting to see it here in 2020. Uh, and I expect it to, to ramp up once we get data for 2021. Um, and so that this dispersion is not constant. This red, these red lines would be what we expect if price change just varied at its historical average of dispersion in commodity uh, price change was just kind of constant, but it's not, right? So there's this pattern where uh, when inflation is low on average, the dispersion in price change is low. When you ramp up, um, when inflation increases, dispersion increases. And I'll just wrap up with this pattern, uh, which is that plotting here, the average uh, change in price, change in average change in the consumer price index against the variation in price change. So there's this pattern, right? When inflation is high on average, there's a lot of differential price change. We're here in, uh, this is 2020, right? So very clearly a lot of differential inflation going on. Um, and then I concluded that um, that blog post with some ideas about how to understand inflation in a way that um, is not very typical at all, right? Almost all uh, talk about inflation is one of two things. It's either about the money supply or um, something like supply change shortages right now. Uh, but what people don't talk about is um, who is raising prices the fastest. And there's pretty overwhelming evidence that it's big corporations that are able to raise prices quickly. Um, so this is, again, this is data from uh, Jonathan Nitsen and Shimshon Bickler. And Jonathan is somebody I work with quite, quite often. So what he's done here is plotted the annual change in the wholesale price index. So that's just a measure of inflation against what he calls the differential markup. So uh, markup is, uh, is profit as a percentage of sales. And what he's done here is take the markup of the 500 largest corporations in the US and compared it to all corporations. So what happens is that when inflation is high, uh, the markup of these big companies tends to increase and vice versa when inflation is low, the, the, the markup, relative markup decreases. Um, you can do the same thing with net profit. 
So when inflation is high, the the net profit um, here measured per employee of big corporations, it increases relative to the rest of the business universe. And did I put the last, no, I'll talk about that after. Um, so this is really painting a, a picture in which we're not talking about the money supply per se, or even really supply shortages. We're talking about who has the power to raise prices most quickly. And it seems to be that the, the largest companies are able to benefit. So this doesn't, not an, expla an explanation of uh, why uh, inflation happens really. We still don't understand that, but it tells us who benefits and it, it's reliably the biggest corporations that benefit. Uh, so with that, I thought we could just open things up for discussion. Great. Uh, one thing I noticed on your uh, chart, um, the third to last one, I believe, was it looks almost like since the late 90s and the early 2000s that the price variation was even higher than the historical average. Is that possible? Um, yeah, visually, it does look that way. I haven't... Um run any analysis. Um, one, one aspect of this, one aspect of this is that you've got to be aware of is that the number of commodities tracked by the, um, the CPI has changed. Mm -hmm. uh, so you have to factor that in. Like back in 1910, they were tracking very few things. They're tracking food and maybe like men's clothing was very limited, uh, whereas today they're tracking thousands of commodities. So um, I'm not sure if the data is good enough to judge that, but it does certainly look that way, that like even though inflation was low historically in the 90s and 2000s, that the spread was fairly high. Uh, so that that's something to research. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, obviously you might expect the variation to increase if you increase the amount of goods just because you might get maybe, more. Maybe, right. especially if the sample earlier on was maybe very specific. Uh, so certainly things, including things like more volatile commodities like energy. So I don't think that was included early on. Mm -hmm. Gasoline. I mean, it, it really in the 1910s, it really wasn't much of a commodity. Um, energy is super volatile. What else is volatile? Um, well, and consumer electronics, they're not necessarily volatile, but they have a very different pattern. They've yeah. often, um, there's been deflation. Well, I should, uh, I should preface that. The CPI will tell you, if you look at the index price of a computer, that there's been deflation. But what they're really saying is that they've adjusted the price of com computers for quality, right? So the quality right. of computers has gone up. So they call this a hedonic price um, adjustment. So the quality of computers has gone up, obviously. Um, and what they then say is, okay, a quality increase um, converts itself into uh, a decrease in the price. Yeah. Um, so there's a lot of problems with that method, but that's just the way the data is, is presented when you download it. So it looks like the price of computers, televisions also has uh, decreased a lot in the last 20 years. Yeah. Even I, though I, the absolute price, say, for a, for a laptop is a little bit higher than it was. Yeah, years I was ago. just looking at that methodology because I was wondering about the, the quality adjustments and I was just reading up on that today. And it's... Yeah, it seems uh, difficult to do that really well. Like, and and then that sort of puts the question back on: What are we actually measuring when we're measuring prices? Yeah, it's a, it's a it's a huge can of worms. I mean, it again, like the price, like calculating the consumer price index, you're calculating an average. So you have all these metrics for things that have changed, say, in a computer, right? The hard drives 
have increased in capacity and, and writing, read and write speed. CPUs have gotten better, GPUs have gotten better. So you can each for each of these things, you can calculate their changes, but then how you want to lump that into an average change in the quality of computers is basically an arbitrary decision. Um, if you really want to get into the can of worms that there's a, a very um, neoclassical methodology where they try to look at, they say that, okay, prices actually reveal the utilities that a commodity gives. So we'll look at the different um, prices of all different computers, say a computer with the uh, core i7 or whatever Intel is making now, different cores, and we'll look at the different prices on the market, and we'll try to isolate that and say this reveals the utility of a different um, core processing speed, and we'll use that to uh, adjust for quality changes. But it doesn't really change the fact that um, you're just kind of picking a method and saying that's right. Um, mm -hmm. So I, this is, I don't think you see the thing about these quality changes is that they don't really have a, any effect on the inflation numbers right now, because mm -hmm. uh, the quality changes happen quite slowly. Where they do have an effect is for measuring like real GDP. So deflating real GDP. Um, that can they have an effect in that, but kind of in the last two years, it's not really it's not really part of the the discussion. I think more important is that uh, the price change of different commodities all over the map. Mm -hmm. Aaron, yeah, I guess um, Blair, what I'm trying to understand is. Um, when we look at the variation in different prices and different goods, right? Uh, th those goods change over time. And the uh, uh, BOS does its best effort to sort of keep the basket of goods somewhat stable um, so that they have a little bit of comparison. There's breakpoints, of course, as it goes on. Um, but even if, I guess I'm trying to understand what, what kind of decisions are trying to, would you recommend change in the uh, measurement of the CPI and what kind of decisions would those drive uh, policy-wise, either policy-wise, financially, or um, policy-wise in terms of um, uh, the monetary um, uh, policy of the Federal Reserve, and things like that, that rely on CPI to um, understand some of the decisions that they have to make monetary. Hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of different sides of that. Um, So I think you got to one side of it is just cost of living um, measurement. So I think historically the CPI was created to try to calculate how um, cost of living adjustments should be made to various things. I think maybe it was for veterans pay originally. I'm not really sure about the historical reasons. Uh, so on that side of it, What's important to understand is that kind of the effects of inflation are not the same person to person. It depends on your particular commodity basket. Um, now, I don't know how, like, I don't know how you would implement that into policy because you really have no idea which each, each person's commodity basket is, but at least that's something that you should be aware of. As far as the broader picture of inflation and, and policy, I think that first and foremost, I think in general, in economics, uh, average indicators are often more deceiving than they are revealing. This goes for inflation numbers, same with GDP numbers. What's more interesting is always the composition uh of the the change so i can't really comment on the federal reserve i mean number one I'll, I'll, okay i will offer a comment the only real tool that governments are interested in right now for combating inflation is raising or lowering the interest rate 
Um, and I don't think that's particularly effective. And it really ignores the fact that not everybody is, it just assumes that the problem is too much money, right? Too much credit. Um, but it ignores the fact that not everybody is raising prices the same rate. And so if you really wanted to, I mean, fundamentally, the problem of inflation is not on the money side, it's the price change. You, you could imagine somehow that money flooded the market, but prices didn't change just because people didn't, you could like imagine a world in which prices were just in, yeah. regulated by law. So there yeah, I, I, be... I think I think some economists would distinguish between um, say monetary monetary inflation, so increase in the money supply, however that's measured. There's a couple different measurements there and uh, price inflation, which, which you're talking about here. Um, so yeah, well, you can yeah. certainly measure the the increase in the money supply. Um, I don't find it very convincing uh, to argue that that the money supply is driving inflation. It certainly has no link to prop really to differential price change, and that's really the big problem. It's just that nobody nobody talks about it. Nobody wants to look at why some sectors and some companies are, are able to raise prices faster. And I th think the reason that nobody wants to, or very few people want to talk about that is that it involves looking at power, in my opinion. I um, think this might be a, an inter a good place to, to segue to, to, to oil prices, because I think this has been a big driver of the current uh, thing of inflation. I think power has a big part to play in it. Um, I um, uh, initially was, you know, like, like everyone else, oh, the war in Ukraine is raising prices. That was the, certainly the catalyst. But as I thought about it more and, and was thinking about it today, I was thinking, isn't the real problem OPEC? Like, um, there's uh, one organization, OPEC Plus now, that controls 90% of oil reserves. Uh, can't they set the price to be whatever they want? Presumably not exactly, but. Well, I kind of anticipated this question. So I have one more slide I'm, I'll show you just <laughs> to uh, frame this uh, discussion. Let's see. Um, so. This is the um, this is again analysis from Jonathan Nitson, and the, the red dashed line here is the relative price of crude oil. So it's the price of crude oil compared to the consumer price index, and uh, the axis is on the right. And then this black line is the differential earnings per share of, of oil companies. So you take the earnings average earnings per share in all the big oil companies. And then you divide it by the earnings per share of all public firms in the world. And what you find really is that the earnings per share, so really profitability of oil companies is just comes down to the price of oil. And I mean, like you say, this this points to the importance of OPEC. Like, it's very hard to say that shortages are the problem, um, because why would that then affect profitability? Um, whereas, if you say that we have big cartels that are able to restrict the supply of oil uh, and benefit from it, although they don't have absolute ability to do that. But basically, the profitability of oil companies, uh, the relative profitability of oil companies boils down to really just the price of oil relative to other commodities. Uh, so I think that's important to realize. And it's very also related to war. Uh, so these spikes, I don't have this chart available, but these spikes in uh, price of oil and the relative profitability of oil companies correlate really tightly to wars in mostly the Middle East. Um, and the thing about these wars is that 
um, they're rarely actually driving a real um, shortage. I, I'm not aware of any like real shortages of oil. It's about the perception and fear of shortages. And I think OPEC is able to benefit from that perception. Um, I, I was so thinking, would, go ahead, would, would your recommendation then be that, say, the United States and um, Venezuela, Mexico start drilling more oil, Canada? <laughs> no, well, I mean, there, there's there's a way to create an alternate supply there, right? And yeah, well, I mean, long term, it would be a better idea uh, to try to wean yourself from oil. I think that's the long term goal. Um, there's no really easy solution with oil because by its nature, it's uh, just concentrated in a few places in the world, right? The Middle East, Canada, the United States, um, Venezuela, and that's just the way that uh, that resource works. Um, renewable energy is is you know, much more equally distributed, but it's got its own problems, which is probably a topic for a different salon. Um, uh, now, I was thinking um, about the, the, the OPEC plus and how it's a, a cartel. If this was entirely within the jurisdiction of, of one country, it would probably be illegal. <laughs> for collusion and so on. Um, I think there's a couple of questions this raises, like should, should, should we as an international community like make price collusion like that illegal under international law? And, and the second part might be, um, should, should, should like countries, uh, should companies that, uh, you know, are have majority owners in countries where this kind of thing is illegal. Be participating in, in I I I think Shell and BP and these uh, Exxon Mobil are running a lot of the oil rigs and and refineries, uh, or maybe not a lot of them, but some of them uh, in OPEC countries. I might be wrong about that, but um, should they be? I don't know who that. I don't know if that's particularly. I don't know for you, I'm, but an, that's, I'm not. Yeah. I'm certainly not an expert on the history of the OPEC uh, cartel, um, but I'm not aware of any mechanism to to kind of fight against it. I don't think international law really helps us because, uh, well, when it comes down to it, there. There is no international law, right? Like you're you're trying to impose um, behavior on, say, like Saudi Arabia and Venezuela, and if they don't want to, you have no recourse. Of There's no enforcement. You can't enforce that kind of stuff. And if you can't yeah. enforce it, I mean, you can write all the laws you want, but unless they're enforced, it's moot. I mean, yeah, well, isn't that what happened with the first Iraq War? Enforcement mm -hmm. on the uh, freedom of uh, relative freedom of uh, uh, Kuwait and, and its uh, industries and sovereignty there. So uh, your enforcement mechanism just comes down to warfare, basically. Right. If you and want to break an international cartel, yeah. Right. And it comes down to you know which countries are going to back that international law, and you know you taking it to the Hague, and if the Hague judges, mm -hmm. what what exactly are they, you know, how is it enforced? What's the explanation for uh, why they don't raise prices the rest of the time? It's a good question. Uh, I, there isn't a, a really good explanation. So that's the thing about inflation. So we have this data just to back up a, a bit that we know that when inflation gets rolling, uh, bigger companies are able to play the game better. But that doesn't explain why it's not rolling all the time. And the best explanation that I've seen for this, again, is from Jonathan Nitzen, who basically says that inflation is fundamentally destabilizing. So once it gets rolling, 
you're it's a you're rolling the dice. You may be able to win if you're a big company, but you're basically restructuring the whole economy, and you know it can go really wrong. Uh, you you can get hyperinflation and things can go very very badly. So it's not a game that companies want to play all the time. Um, for for whatever reason, when things are stable, companies are yes they raise prices, but they're very um, aware of the perception, right? Like if Apple tomorrow or say in ten years ago, I don't know, tripled the price of its iPhones. Um, people will balk and just say, "No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to buy that." They'll go to a competitor. But once you get into an inflation regime where ever, if things are ramping up, everybody can play it. So it's this kind of um, herd behavior. It's very difficult to explain how it, how it, why it starts and why it ends. Um, but once it gets rolling. Um, everybody starts to play it and the big companies are able to win faster. So like with the war in Ukraine, like, yeah, there's a supply problem with, with oil produced by Ukraine, but I, I haven't looked at the data, but I really doubt that any of the strategic reserves are getting um, depleted, right? That would be a true supply shortage. Yeah, it's I, mostly I, I the percent. I don't believe Ukraine produces oil. I believe it's the the, the sanctions on Russia that is a mm -hmm. the plus of the OPEC plus. Um, sure. Okay. Um, that that's what's restricting uh, oil supply, particularly and particularly gas supply for Europe right now. And a lot right. of those pipelines who run through the Ukraine and through um, Romania and Poland. Yeah. Um, so I know so I was talking to a Ukraine, friend the Ukraine, other day about yeah, who is benefiting. Ukraine's more to your point. Ukraine is more of the um, uh, impact on the food supply. Which yeah. is creating a lot of um, uh, food-driven, again, uh, uh, supply-side inflation in Europe and uh, the Middle East, places like Turkey, um, North Africa, uh, that would get a large uh, grain influx from from Ukrainian producers. That yeah, both can't. I was just talking to a friend so. two days ago, and we were talking about who's um, benefiting from the energy price change, even. Right now, like the price of oil is actually not that high historically, but what, what's happened is that the, the refineries and the retailers are really benefiting. So gasoline prices are through the roof. And so it's the retailers and the refiners who are breaking in uh, money right now. Uh, so that's, that's really interesting. Why that is, I, I, I mean, I don't honestly know, but I think that they have a good excuse, right? They have an excuse, and people will say, "Look, it's there's a shortage," and okay, it's just high prices. Same with food. I mean, <clears throat> there's um, a very strong link to the the change in the price of food and the the um, profitability of food, like um, end use food sellers, like basically the big grocery stores. Their profitability skyrockets when food prices rise. Um, and that doesn't make a lot of sense if we're just talking about uh, shortages. I mean, there's, um, because then why don't farmers, you know, make more money? Um, um, I, I just want to be clear that um, Ukrainian food supply is served 25% for some markets. So that's, a, mm -hmm. that's an insane uh, a supply shock there. And we're not talking about like, produce food and we're talking about just the raw grain wheat yeah um so so i uh was talking with a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago who works in marketing for a for a uh, just to leave it anonymous what, what kind of industry but um they uh the, they have a have profitability goals or, or profit goals for the year and um his bosses you know said we're going to raise prices um and I and I was a little bit confused because you know obviously like if if the production prices are going up, that that might make sense. But I was like, but fuel is like a really small part of your business, right? It must be like I don't know five percent. You know, he's like, yeah, it's probably something about that. And I said, so how much are you raising prices? And I can't remember the exact amount, but it was by a lot. And I and I said, so how are they justifying that? 
And they said, well, that's my job. <laughs> he's, he's in marketing. So they said, just write something convincing and, uh, and, you know, blame the war, obviously. Like, so I, I didn't realize it was that blatant, but it seems to be, um, sometimes just very blatant. You, you have a good excuse. There's a war going on. People are expecting certain things to increase in price. Uh, and so companies, and, and this is a B2B company, so this is not directly affecting consumers, but um, they can raise their prices with, you know, uh, in their relationships with their customers. And so they, they have a, yeah, they'll do it. So with regard to refineries and oil, um, I know locally, obviously, this is just a blip on the radar, but the refineries around here are having not issues with um, oil per se, but with people. Um, wastewater is a huge thing in refinery um, oil, you know, gasoline production. And they don't have a lot of people who are um, actually certified for wastewater. And when they only have two people in one refinery, you know, those two people have to split the hours. And apparently it's like, they literally have to have a wastewater person on site on a regular basis, you know, like if they're producing, if they are refining, they have to have a wastewater person there. Cause if something goes wrong, you've got huge contamination problems and they don't have, they literally are begging people to go back and get certifications for wastewater. And I mean, just weird things that you don't even think about, but it's people, the people are actually the, 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 that's what's missing in that link of why the refineries and that's why they're charging more money is because these people, the ones that are willing to stay, you know, their salaries have gone up 35% in the last year. Hmm. Yeah. Production always has two inputs, right? And you have capital and you have people, right? Labor. Uh, Josh, your, your story reminded me of, um, this theory of administered prices. So back in the Great Depression, an economist named um, Gardner Means looked at um, price change starting in the 1929 stock crash. And over the course of the 1930s, and he, he basically found there were two different types of sectors in the United States. There was a, a competitive sector, which was um, where prices actually decrease. And this really is consistent with the theory of supply and demand that you'd see in a textbook, right? If, if um, demand goes down from the Great Depression, you expect companies to lower their prices to try to um, uh, get more people to buy. And so prices come down and production actually is unchanged. And that's what he found in certain sectors, especially agriculture at the time, uh, that price during the Great Depression, prices collapsed, but production was pretty much unchanged. Then he found another sector, which he called the administered price sector, where prices didn't change. And he was basically saying these prices are administered. They have a rule of thumb. We want certain probability or whatever, this is just what our price is and we don't change it. So there's, it's not really a competitive market. And in that sector, those sectors, prices stayed constant, but production collapsed. And so his argument was that it was in those sectors where the Great Depression happened. If you define the depression as a collapse in, in the industrial output. And, and I think this really remains too for a lot of businesses, especially big businesses. There's, they're not um, looking at a market to, to kind of compete for prices. They have administrative rules that they use to um, to guide them. So there's not a lot of research about how this relates to in inflation, mostly because there's not data. What I would really love to have is data at the firm level. So like a price index for a specific firm, but I'm not aware of any data like that. That's interesting. So um, I, I was wondering uh, in the lead up to this also, one of the things you, 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 you mentioned that uh, comes from um, Jonathan Nitzen is this idea that um, 
you know, prices are changed based on power. And um, one thing um, that I, th I think Jared and I were discussing that um, on Discord was like, to what extent do you expect prices um, in in countries with with strong unions, for example, to 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 change differently than in countries with weak unions? Um, presumably, you'd expect the wages to go up faster during inflation um, in countries with strong unions. I don't know if you know anything about that. Well, that would be, I think, a reasonable expectation. I'm not aware of research on that, so I can't really speak about it. Um, but yeah, in general, whenever they're uh, in countries that have more unions, or just looking, say, at the, the same country like the United States over time, the unionization rate is really um, predicts the the labor share of the pie. So um, how that would relate to the rate of inflation, I, I'm not sure. Um, I guess it depends on how quickly unions are able to react, right? Like we're at, so for instance, my, uh, I'm still on the, the uh, I have, still have a contract with the Toronto District School Board because I was a high school teacher and I just kind of stayed in their system. That contract is negotiated every three years, maybe. So it would be very hard for the union to keep up like with inflation. They would basically have to, in the next bargaining round, say, well, we want a huge increase, but there's not, I won't get anything until then. Um, yeah. So that's the side of it. Um, I that's really interesting. I was I was reading some union contracts uh, of some employers here in, in Switzerland because I was curious about this because um, there's not that much inflation in Switzerland, um, and there's probably lots of reasons for that. But um, one of them I thought about was maybe because of the strong unions here, and it's a little bit unusual because Switzerland is a quite a liberal country in the in the classical sense, but it still has strong unions, so it's less socialist than many other European countries, um, but but has very strong unions and. Um, um, Many union contracts have in them that um, when inflation exceeds 1%, it automatically mm. triggers a, a salary negotiation between the union and the mm. employer. <laughs> well, that's not part of my salary. My, that's an interesting contract. That's not part of mine. I know it's very common for unions to peg their, their bargaining to the consumer price index. Um, well, that it is here as well. So it's automatically, there is a price mm. at, um, actually, I don't know if, if it's common to, to peg it directly to the CPI, but um, it's common anyway to have a price increases pegged into the contract. So it's, you know, that you expect the 1% increase in, in wages, even when, in, I mean, inflation in Switzerland has been consistently less than 1% for a, a long time now, so. Interesting. Yeah, that is something to, I haven't uh, looked at the data internationally. That is something to, that would be really interesting to do. And then, so I was reading the Paul Krugman art, article that you uh, put in the, in the notes for this uh, session, Josh, and, and he was speculating about the future of this inflation wave. So I thought maybe that would be fun to do. Nobody knows, obviously. Um, uh, how it will play out. We think it's. He was arguing. I think it was very. It was. I don't remember the the language that he used, but essentially just short term, like mm -hmm. a consequence of the pandemic, couple years of inflation, and that's the end of it. I'm less convinced. I think that historically, once inflation waves start rolling. Um, they're hard to stop. Well, this article was from December. So uh, mm. this was not a recent one. He, he, there was some small amounts of inflation back then. I think a lot of yeah. economists were saying this was a, a temporary and they started changing their tune once the war uh, in Ukraine started. Yeah. Yeah. It will be interesting. It'll be interesting to see. Um, 
Right, so a lot of this inflation, especially the fears of inflation started before the war, um, but they didn't start at the beginning of the pandemic. So I'm not sure I, I get the model that like inflation is not related to these shocks, like like literally in a, in a price sense, but it's more like there's there's turmoil, therefore companies can just sort of like raise prices with that, you know, with impunity. Um, Cause that wouldn't, that wouldn't make sense. Like why would that have started eight months ago whenever, whenever things started getting bad? Like when nothing happened eight months ago, like you, if, if you're going to yeah. go with a turmoil theory, that would have been like 2020, that would have been the perfect time for, for big companies to be like, oh, pandemic, therefore, uh, you know, gas prices go up or the pandemic, therefore anything they want to. Um, why did it, why did it have to wait till eight months ago? I don't, I'm not. I'm not seeing that. Uh, yeah, I actually think that it, 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 that has to do a lot with the price of oil still here, because um, at the beginning of the pandemic, it was clear that if people would be locked up, uh, they wouldn't be consuming petrol. So um, commodity prices dropped, and commodities are well, specifically oil prices dropped. They even became negative. I don't know if you recall, but this this was a big big news because oil prices went negative. Oil futures, I should say, uh, the, the it was kind of a uh, an un you know an un, unheard of and and uh, phenomenon that the price would go negative because nobody would wanted to t- wanted to take delivery of the of the of the of the oil, and um, so in that context, there's no other nobody else can say, oh, we're raising prices now because oil is down. I mean, there's there's actually no excuse. Whereas um, the other and the other in the other direction, when there's a price in Ukraine and people know that, that there's going to be supply constraints, that's a totally different picture, I guess. Although I I, I think the counterfactual is it could have happened that in the pandemic. Um, something else first triggered an increase in price that we would say, oh no, there's a shortage of masks and the price of masks and then the price of, I don't know, other things start to go up after that. I'm not sure. Well, if yeah. I look at the, um, so we, we can look up this information and kind of come up with a hypothesis as we look at the charts. Like if you look at the oil burnt uh, price over the last year, um, uh, the low point in the last year was probably August of 21, mid-August 21, around $65 a barrel, um, another low around $69 a barrel. But then starting around um, just really the first of the year, you can see a steady increase through the invasion uh, occurred somewhere around like the 20, 24th, I recall, in February. Then you do see a big increase. Um, but at that point, we've already gone up uh, from about six nine dollars to uh, ninety six dollars. But but and do then... know that the uh, Russia was amassing troops at the border, so there was a lot of news about a poss- possible Correct, invasion yeah. lo- some some a long time before the actual invasion. Correct. Yeah. But but the, the, uh, that if if there was a belief in the market, then that that, that would take place, uh, go through with the invasion. We would expect it to uh, raise a little bit faster. Um, and then the actual invasion happens, we see an increase around one to a, around 127 on the 8th of March. And then it's been around uh, like bouncing in between 120 and 130 since then. So, I mean, there's a number of stories you could tell for that, right? So one is that invasion would constrain oil, but nobody knew that invasion would necessarily constrain oil and nobody knew what the sanctions regime would look like right going into the war like that that wasn't really decided by by anyone at that point and furthermore um not in those first few few weeks of the invasion it was it was believed that uh ukraine would kiev would fall mm-hmm. at least as far as the major powers uh um sort of position themselves so the market uh, so, seems to yeah, yeah have been more prescient than the US government is what you're saying. <laughs> or, I'm not saying the market is more prescient. I'm saying like the, there's there's new uh, I, I guess what, what what is the the cause of the shock that we're arguing here? Are we saying that, that I, I'm a little confused about like whether this is really supply driven like traditional economics phenom- supply side shock phenomenon? or this, this 
power argument um, that, I, that I don't quite understand yet. Uh, um, are they raising prices just because, or like, are there real problems in, in the supply of oil, both on the production, um, uh, processing, and, and uh, eventual consumption side? So, really good questions. Oil is one of the interesting, the most interesting commodities to study because, number one, it's one of the most volatile commodities in terms of price change. And two, right, that's why it's not, left out of the CPI that's traditionally like, according to the news. Right, nothing like a, a free market, a competitive market. It's just the total opposite of a competitive market. And Historically, um, so one of Jonathan Nitzen, he's got a slide that one of his favorite things to do is show newspaper headlines where it says uh, price of oil up due to supply shortages, price of oil, and then another headline, price of oil down due to uh, all those supply shortages or something, and all kinds of contradictory newspaper headlines basically saying, we have no idea like you, you can make supply chain arguments but to my knowledge there has never been an actual shortage of in the in the sense that i would would understand it like in the next century we're going to have a shortage of oil because we're going to have peak oil and a decline and we're running out of oil so there will be a shortage but as I, as far as i understand it it's really hard to make an argument that there have been shortages in the past. So if you want to understand changes in the price I, I think of oil, we're you have... a little young to remember the, the gas lines in the 70s, but yeah. Well, I mean, I... even in the 1970s, there were yeah, I mean, the most interesting thing about oil for me is geopolitics, not and that maybe affects supply chains. Um but it's not easy to, to understand in just terms of supply and demand. So if we're, if we're living in a sort of Star Trek universe where, um, uh, what is that term, like a resource-based economy or something like that, then there would be would have been zero shortages of oil because we, we actually ha always had enough to power our vehicles and, and factories and so on in, in just pure quantity terms, just regarding, you know, ignoring prices for the moment. Yeah. I mean, that's kind of my understanding. Um, to back up a, a bit of like my, my understanding, to back up a bit about kind of the story since the, the pandemic, my, my perception of it was um, kind of everybody was in shock in the first six months when everything shut down. And that was really unprecedented. Um, and then when things started getting back to normal, there were obviously all kinds of problems with limited problems with with um, supply chains. And once those problems started getting noticed, I mean, certainly there were some commodities that increased in prices. And I think since then, um, as I would understand it, we've just kind of entered an inflation, what I would call a, a regime where the expectation is that we have inflation. So the expectation from all companies is that we need to raise prices, otherwise we're gonna be under water. And it's like kind of like a switch that once you get into that mindset, then everybody plays it. Um, but but I don't, I, I would, just, would you still expect like downward pressure just from competition or is that like, are you only talking in industries where there's relatively little competition? Like, like even with oil and stuff, I can still go across the street to the cheaper gas station, right? So it's, there's still pressure somewhere to have lower prices. Like, you, yeah. what, what am I missing here from, the, from this model? Sorry, Julie. No, it's okay. Um, I noticed on one of your graphs, used car prices have gone up. Um, mm -hmm. And I know I happen to have a, um, a good friend who's a general manager for a very, very large car dealership around here. And he's not getting the new cars, 
that he in his, his new car inventory is down 70% of what it was pre pandemic. And so he's like, you know, I can sell used cars for the same price I can sell new cars because the people who rotate their cars every two years still want to rotate their cars <laughs> mm-hmm. and they'll come in and buy, you know, they, they aren't waiting for the new cars and the new cars. He said that, I mean, you know, he has seven different models of cars and he said that, you know, his particular dealership doesn't um, increase over sticker. But he said, you know, we have several other dealerships around here that they're selling it 15, 20% over sticker for a new car. Wow. And I've wow. never, ever paid sticker for a car, period, the end. Right. So I, right. it just shocked me when he was like, yeah, I can't keep stuff on the lot. The new cars come in on Thursday, every other Thursday, and they're gone by Saturday. Yeah, we were forced to buy a car recently. And the, uh, yeah, we had to pay over sticker. and. We had to wait two months for it, and and we had no negotiating leverage, right? Like right, none. And none, and that's what uh, he said is you know there's none. He he tries to keep his ethics you know in place, so he has he's been selling everything at sticker, but he said you know as a result they're not making nearly as much as, but they also are one of, are the largest car dealership in this area, so they get first dibs on stuff that comes in anyway, so. Hmm. Well, to get to your question, Lawrence, like for, take a like a gas station, like get any in Canada, prices are about double what they were. I don't know four months ago. So the question is, well, why doesn't any specific gas station just lower their prices and just sell a bunch of oil and or sell a bunch of gas and undercut everybody else and. They could, obviously. There's nothing stopping them. But I, I guess the, the mental math is the gas station says, how much more could I make? Like, they have a finite capacity. There's only so many cars they can get to go through. So if they cut the price of oil in half, they'd have to more than double, um, you know, how much gas they sell versus just do nothing and play the game with everybody else and make more money at the that- same volume yeah plus um, i guess the, the the margin is so small anyway right so if they have a i, th- I think i read somewhere like it's less than two percent margin um, for retailers, so, yes, or retailers. Retail. so most of the money they make anyway is in the convenience store so if they uh you know two per, if, if the two percent ends up being double for gas because the price is doubled that's great for them but they're not going to say let us reduce it to one percent so we keep the the margin the absolute margin the same um, but now our prices are going to be yeah. uh, 1% cheaper than the competitor. It's not worth it to them probably because it won't even attract that many new customers, I guess, if it's 1% yeah. cheaper. And then your expectation is exactly what you would think you'd get in, in a competitive market. So everybody's kind of competing. Uh, we'll try to undercut. And, and, um, but I, I, there are very few competitive markets in my opinion, like I, and you look at things like like oil or or big tech, there's just so much collusion, and collusion is very easy when there's only a few companies. And I don't know how much of it is actually planned or just implicit, um, but it's very easy um, to collude when there's not uh, a lot of competition. So, um, okay. So I, I, I don't disagree that there is sometimes like uh, price collusion or collaboration, whatever you want to call it. But under this, under the context of inflation, I don't know if that argument makes much sense. Because if you expect the, if because of, if we just consider only supply constraints, right? We expect the uh, supply of oil to be constrained um, either naturally through only so much oil in the ground or artificially through uh, uh, an OPEC uh, uh, reduction in, in capacity or war or whatnot. Um, if you expect the supply to be constrained, then you would also expect the price to increase somewhat because people are competing to buy you know, that barrel of oil that, that is um, available. 
which increases the price of the refinery, which increases the price of gas. It takes time to produce that gasoline. So we get to the actual pump. Then your, your, your competitive uh, um, uh, incentive to you know, be, say, a penny less than, your, than the station across the street has to calculate into how much you expect the overall increase of your goods to, to be at that point you're going to sell it. Because you can't just compete and say, oh, I'm going to take a loss at this in order to compete against the, the guy across the street. You have to also uh, 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 measure in that, that production uh, uh, inflation, right? That PPI that goes into the gasoline. And in that sense, like you're no longer like, this isn't a matter of collusion. This is an actual competitive equilibrium where you're saying, all right, I need to be able to make a profit to stay in business, but also not artificially raise prices so high that my, my competitor says, hey, they're both being unfair and overpriced. So it, under this context, I don't see this it's sort of a price conspiracy thing, but... Um, so you're saying sort of a game, game theoretic conclusion more than a. <laughs> is that right? right? It, it, it's a it's a competitive equilibrium, right? Yeah, you, you have so many goods, you have so many constraints on those goods, you have so much time and uh, resources to produce uh, the thing that you eventually sell, and all that quote prices itself into what the final uh, the final uh, uh, sticker price that you put on the object is. Or, gasoline pump whatever um so in that sense like i i don't know um i guess i uh, what i'm trying to say is i'm not convinced from a traditional standpoint um but i'm, I'm trying to be open to to your argument here and, and see how how it can be, be moved off of that um so how would you analysis what do you make of this this historic relation between the profitability of the the biggest companies and inflation why does that go up and down in tandem so my um my initial thought is that that's kind of vacuous comparison because you're going to sell a good at whatever the good is priced at right and if you are successful at selling your profits go up um i don't this know is how different. To no 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 mm -hmm. this is differential right. right so it's not just the markup it's the differential markup it's the markup of the biggest companies relative to everybody else. So it's saying they benefit more than everybody else. So that has nothing to do with inflation, just raw right. numbers. You yeah, think that everybody would go up and down together. Yeah, that, that can be explained by by size, as in, in Julie's uh, car dealership example, they have a larger market uh, that they uh, serve. Uh, so just by being able to sell more cars to more people, their profits are, margins are higher. That can be an efficiency thing um, that can cut out uh, waste at the uh, oil refinery, whatever. But do you think that they can, can do that in tandem with inflation that quickly? And that's the other thing. There's the whole uh, theory of sticky prices within uh, uh, macroeconomics uh, markets where economists will look at the price, but also look at the price change and ask why, well, why isn't this price changing sooner? There's a number of factors. So if you're a restaurant, you print out your menus, you print out the price on the menu, and then uh, uh, there's a certain cost and constraint in pre-producing the menu, resetting prices, etc. cetera. Um, that's true for any business. Um, if you're somehow able to be more responsive and change prices more quickly, you might be able to do that. But there's always there's always some kind of lag and some kind of constraint in how you, how you change that. So there's a whole body of research looking at sticky prices, like how this stuff change, how's it factored in inflation, whatnot. Um, to your point, like there isn't a perfect science here. Like there is no uh, law of gravity or relation between, uh, uh, there's like much softer relations, but that's because there's so many different activities that people go through and choices people have to make, preferences, et cetera. So, um, that's kind of a traditionalist view. So, so, so Blair, you said like um, it's a ratio, right? Like you said, the big companies versus everybody. So I think your interpretation was that the big companies had raised prices, but wouldn't 
uh, a compatible interpretation would be that everybody else failed to, real, to raise prices. Like in other words, like the small companies aren't paying attention. Reagan, can you mute your, uh, your mic? Can, or maybe can one of you mute Reagan's mic? If I don't know that I can do it. Oh, thanks, yeah. Reagan. Um, so another interpretation would be that the smaller companies just uh, fail to raise, raise their prices, right? They fail to pay attention to the, uh, the, to the price of, of their inputs, let's say. And or, or like, like Jared was saying, maybe their, their prices are too sticky because they're not reactive enough. Um, so it could just be like the smaller companies just kind of suck in a sense and they don't, they don't adapt fast enough. Their inputs go up, their outputs don't go up. And so it's not, it's not that, I mean, maybe the big companies did nothing but simply adjust at all. Um, and they're, they're not necessarily making more profits. They're making more profits. They're not making more profits than they would normally they're just making more profits than the smaller companies because the smaller companies are making less profits. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't say anything about the absolute size of the profit. All you're saying is that relative profitability for big companies goes up during uh, bouts of inflation. I mean, you have to factor in that during inflation, everybody's trying to raise prices. So you could say that small companies are slower to react, although I don't know I don't think that's the right language. I think they're just less able to react. Um, I don't know, like you look at say a, a, a small like mom and pop um, coffee shop, they have a personal relation with their customers and they don't really want to raise prices. Um, and they don't have a lot of power to do that because people can go elsewhere. But if Starbucks wants to do it or here in Canada, Tim Hortons, it's just much easier for them. In Canada, if you don't want a coffee at a Tim Hortons in a small town, then you don't get a coffee, right? There's no alternative. So if Tim Hortons raises its prices, they've raised their prices and that's that really. Um, so I think- Wait, we, why, why, does, why do you feel like the small coffee shop, somebody goes to a small coffee shop, if the price went up, the customer would go elsewhere, but at a Starbucks, they wouldn't go elsewhere? I think it's more that they might be upset and my, my parents used to run a cafe and I, I think that, that resonates with me what Blair said that if a customer comes in and, and, and gets angry because they raised the prices that would hurt them sort of personally and it, it wouldn't matter even if the customer would buy the coffee anyway it's that, that anger that they might want to avoid. Yeah so like I say what we're missing here the smoking gun is, a, is price indexes for different commodities. So you could say, look, um, Apple is raising prices of its commodities faster than, well, it's a weird situation because there's no competitor that's small that makes an equivalent product. But you see what I mean? That's what we're missing here. We have kind of aggregate data where we're looking at profitability, which rises and falls with inflation, the profitability, relative profitability of big companies, but we don't know exactly what's going on with their prices so we're inferring this is my inference that they are able to uh inflate prices more rapidly i don't find any other arguments for like efficiency very convincing because yeah you could say there are economies of scale i think there are but those are play out over the long term i don't see why they would fluctuate in the short term with inflation um, I just don't find any other argument other than the fact that big companies have the power to play the game better, the inflation game better. It doesn't explain why inflation comes and goes, uh, but kind of explains the disaggregate picture a bit more. Um. Well, I, I guess one quick cl clarification. Um, when, when you say, when you're criticizing the, the, the CPI index, you're, you're specifically criticizing, say, the, the headlines in, in, the, in the papers, right? And that's, that's your level of, uh, of criticism? Um, because because the, the disaggregated data is readily available by, by the, uh, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, so it's there, right? But 
Um, yeah, I mean, I have kind of um, niche critiques of the the data in the CPI. It's not really important for this talk about inflation. Like I alluded to it in the way they calculate their price adjustments, uh -huh. um, but that's only a subset of a, of um, um, commodities. Like they don't really do quality adjustments for food, uh, oil, or anything like that. So. Uh -huh. They do. I, I, I want to challenge that uh, factual claim there. That there are quality adjustments for for food. Like if you look at the uh, the basket of goods here, um, uh, I can share the uh, link that I'm looking at. Um, so bls.gov/cpi has um, all this information uh, compiled here. Uh, I believe under average prices on, on this one that I just uh, I shared, you'll find mm -hmm. uh, the food breakdowns and whatnot there. But it's also break down in terms of you know, airlines, um, um, tuition, energy, et cetera. How is that different um, from, I've, I've got another page open mm -hmm. where it, it does say no quality adjustments for food. Uh, if you, I just put the link in, there's a specific page on quality adjustments. Oh, I'm sorry, um, quality adjustments. Um, I don't know how, how would you measure that. That's somewhat subjective, that's the, right? Well, no, that's the, my there's, point. <laughs> there's the well, there's the hedonic price adjustments that the BLS does, where they, you know, they say well, this was what Blair was explaining at the beginning that sure they do the this thing where they create this matrix of uh, features for different products and then figure out how each feature con contributes to the total price and then when the features set changes of the average product that's bought or if they have to replace one product with another because it's not available anymore. Like they, they keep one particular laptop and the right you're, and the right. CPI. substitution of goods uh, a question there. Th um, then they do the quality adjustment and that doesn't happen for, for food. I think that's what Blair was saying. Yeah, right. It, it well, doesn't I, happen I think for that, food. Well, I think the reason there is that you know, you're going to need to eat something and there's a certain substitution uh, that people are willing to make in order to eat. <laughs> uh, but that would a, be but my explanation a, there. But I, I'm right, but it's a it's a good it. question to to think about like. If the caloric content of food or if the quality of, you know, like if a banana you get in the store today is much better than a banana you got 20 years ago, the CPA has no way of of <laughs> has no way of 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 taking that into account. But why would it need to? I guess is my question. Be because um, because, I'm, because I'm I actually assume <laughs> that the quality of all products is increasing over time as our like economy gets better and we we tend to um you know, be 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 picky about what we buy at supermarkets or anywhere. Generally, we will always tend to pick the better products, and so over time, we're going to get better products. And if that's not accounted for in inflation, then it makes inflation it overstays inflation, right? Because you you think that prices are are staying the same, but actually, if you would do a quality adjustment, you would notice that it would be going down if we had consumed the same quality of products. Um. So I'm, Jared, I'm just not I, I'm sure not what your question is. Can, um, uh, can you explain? Uh, uh, can you explain, Josh, once more? Um, I'm not understanding. If the quality is higher in the same bananas today, then you would expect the price to be what higher? Or lower? No, no. It's it, it's it's. I'm it's, sorry. It, I, I'm kind of extending what the, the hedonic adjustment that the, they they already do, and, and uh -huh. saying like for all the prices they don't do it for. Um, presumably, there's also some sort of um, quality improvement. It's just not measured. So the idea with the quality adjustment is, say I have a car, just assume it has constant price, like a Ford Mustang. Say there's no price change over 40 years, but the BLS will measure the quality of a, a Mustang, however they do it. And if it gets better, then in their price index of that Mustang, if the quality gets better, then the price index actually goes down. So they're saying there's actually deflation, even though the sticker price hasn't changed, we're equating more quality with uh, deflation. So the quality has gotten better, but the price has stayed the same. So your dollar kind of has more value. Uh, so there's deflation. That's how, that's how it works. And they do it for, big time for automobiles, um, consumer electronics. They don't do it for food. I think pretty obvious reasons like the 
things that they track for food, the staples, they there's not a big change in in their quality. Um, but the bigger picture of the CPI, um, I mean, we can argue about its methods. I just I just think in the bigger picture, I'm not interested in the averages. I just think I wish people would focus on the disaggregate. And that's obviously less sexy and it's it's harder to do just uh, to get a picture of it. But I think that's where the story is for me. Um, yeah, oh, I, I get that. Um... So um, I, I guess I, I, I'm wondering, like, well, this data is available. If you focus focus on the disaggregated um, prices, uh, what's the um, what's the goal there? Um, it's question number one, and and then yeah, yeah we'll just leave it leave, leave it at that question. Uh, what, what's the goal in focusing on the disaggregated uh, uh, price changes? Um, well, I have a goal that's different than the government's goal. Right? The government has a goal. Yeah, I can explain. Yeah, I can explain the, the government's goal, or maybe I have a different interpretation. But I'll, I'll let you. Uh, yeah, sorry, I shouldn't cut you off with that. So go ahead. Well, my understanding of the government's goal. I mean, they say it very. Clearly, they want to, to keep the average price change low, and that's all they care about. They don't really care about what's going on beyond the average. That's not, I see, um, and I come at it from a different perspective. I'm not a policy person. I'm a researcher, and I want to understand what's causing inflation and how it behaves. And as a researcher, that's why I'm interested in the disaggregate picture because the average just hides most of what's going on. Um, the policy side of it, um, I don't okay. know. I mean, that's probably why I'm not in policy. <laughs> Maybe you have something to say about it. Yeah, I, I guess. So my understanding um, is that the CPI is chosen as a, a leading indicator, not the only indicator, but as leading indicator of inflation, because it's supposed to capture what the largest cross section of the public encounters in their daily uh, financial decisions. And understand that it only, only captures that as an indicator. Um, means that they're interested in how that indicator moves over time, in month over month, uh, year over year uh, basis, so that they can then calculate policies both in the fiscal sense, so um, what they like funding a WIC program or a food program, something like that, or funding um, uh, employment changes at the federal level, um, military level, et cetera. Um, and, if, and on the fiscal side, we can understand like that cross section, like how the prices are moving on the average, understand there's variation there um, in order to set those um, uh, policies accordingly. And also on the monetary level, the same. Um, not so much the number of the average itself, but the change in the, the change in the average, that like second derivative, the increase in the rate of inflation may indicate that monetary policy on, on its own uh, needs to change in order to adjust for that rate. The goal there being a, uh, a stabilizing relation so that the, the amount of economic activity, again, this is on a broad scale, is constrained so that people have a better expectation on, in terms of what to expect in their decision-making. Um, both as producers and as consumers. Um, so that's my understanding of why the CPI in particular is, is uh, highlighted. Um, so the Fed will focus on the CPI and also employment levels in order to uh, adjust its policy accordingly. Um, the theory, and I don't, 
think this holds out 100%, but the general theory, 80% of the time, uh, they, they um, make these sort of decisions is that the balance in between inflation and employment together will indicate the overall health of, of the uh, US economy. Um, so that's the reason why they focus on those metrics, headline metrics in particular, and going into a lot more details when they're you know, compiling reports and, and uh, making decisions at the, uh, uh, throughout the, uh, uh, both the um, Federal Reserve and the uh, uh, congressional uh, activities. Um, so so that, that's, that's my understanding of it. Uh, Is it possible? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, I'm just wondering um, if, because um, for, for, we know that inflation is, uh, you know, you, I think, I don't know if you mentioned that, but it's often driven by this inflation expectations and, and, uh, and, if, 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 I mean, we were talking about that before as well, Blair said, if companies expect prices to increase, they have to do it and sort of not to lag behind. Lawrence was mentioning that as well. Maybe small companies fail to do that. So uh, is it possible that um, uh, organizations like the Fed, which keeps a close eye on inflation, is it possible that they're exacerbating the problem? I mean, I, actually, I, I, um, I'm just on the Bureau of Labor Statistics homepage and they have a big tab here that says uh, food prices up uh, largest 12 month increase since 1980. Um, this is kind of like the New York Times headline. <laughs> the Bureau of Labor Statistics maybe well, you know, triggered that. Is that a mistake? Like, should the Bureau of Labor Statistics not put up that kind of thing? Because isn't that exactly what causes inflation when they make it sound like inflation is, is happening? Then all the companies well, go people, read that and say, oh, we better increase our prices. Well, um, people know, um, right? So you go to the grocery store, you see. You see the price of beef has changed or go right, to the gas pump. So what I'm saying is uh, mm -hmm. people are like, it starts somewhere and then the reporting starts and then it becomes like a, it takes off. You know what I mean? Like, of course this, but um, yeah, they were already reporting on small changes before and now the bigger changes have come was potentially as a result of the reporting of the small changes. I see what you're saying there, but um, um, I, I think there's a, a uh, you, you had a question about the Fed and then a question about the, um, uh, about the reporting. Um, uh, so in terms of the qu whether or not the, the reserve is driving inflation, the argument usually is that the, uh, uh, the, the federal funds rate should be uh, uh, set in accordance to the level of inflation and the uh, uh, employment goals uh, uh, in the economy. So if inflation goes up, the federal funds rate um, needs to go up by what's called the Taylor rule. And there's different ways different people calculate this, but the general idea is that you increase that rate in order to um, uh, constrain the amount of uh, activity going on, so that uh, prices are brought back under an inflation target. Um, so the argument over the last year or not it has been whether or not the Fed has uh, sort of underset their rate um, for what was expected to be an inflationary context uh, for various reasons, both supply and uh, fiscally. Um, uh, but then on the other side then, like, uh, should they, should should the CPI be published so that people's expectations aren't like driven upward? I would say yes, because you can imagine a world where there is no CPI, there's no like uh, uh, measured inflation rate, or at least, um, uh, um, uh, organization-led measurement of inflation rate, but you have, you know, thousands of people saying the price of beef has doubled or the price of gas has doubled. So the expect personal expectations worse, huh? yeah. might be even higher. Like right. if you don't have some kind of a benchmark to say, all right, your perspective is this, but also there's regional perspectives. But here, 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 we need to collate this information, bring it together, and have some kind of measurement that, that, that weights like all these different viewpoints. And you get things like the CPI out of, out of our, those efforts. And you can drill down ideally into different regional expectations or uh, re regional measurements, et cetera. So you run the risk, like if, if, if you take off, <laughs> take off that viewpoint uh, and all we have is like your personal experience, then, then you actually lose information about what's, um, what's happening. And yeah. that might drive your expectations way high or way low. Yeah, 
I actually you know, have a specific a hard place. Yeah, you know, I have a specific proposal for for the Bureau of Labor Statistics. They should report the monthly percentage change. This would look much smaller in absolute numbers, <laughs> but it would also have the benefit that uh, it always only presents new information because they put out monthly mm -hmm. annual changes, which makes it look like uh, to me like if if you just uh, see on first glance it makes it look much bigger than it is because you see, you hear oh the 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 april numbers were seven percent and now the uh, may numbers were ten percent uh, that makes it look enormous but actually uh, we're talking about 12 month lagging uh, average mm -hmm. changes right so if they had reported you know two percent um in 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 april and uh, you know 1.8 percent in 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 may or whatever it is uh, you know, you only have the new information, which is how much did it change in the last month, and also mm -hmm. obviously it just is a lot smaller. <laughs> I don't know if that yeah, would really yeah. help, but <laughs> yeah, you, you've raised that point before, and I, I like that idea. Um, I, I imagine it's just hard for them to do, and also hard to be able to explain because when you get into like the year over the, you know, May twenty twenty two versus May twenty twenty one, you're going like May twenty or April 21 to May 21, like that might show up as uh, uh, 1%, but then year over year, you get like three or 4% because of compounding effects over time and things like that. So the mathematics gets a little bit more complicated there and it's yeah. kind of hard to And And to then there might be describe, seasonal but... effects, right? We might expect mm -hmm. that like um, every, I don't know, December prices go up for whatever reason and they come back down mm -hmm. from, from January to March. And if you only predict ch ch showing monthly changes, you, you might be be thinking there's inflation when actually it's just a seasonal effect i, I was looking at some mm -hmm. individual component uh, uh indexes and it there's a there's the, the bls publishes seasonally adjusted ones as well as non-adjusted ones i guess exactly for that reason so you can mm -hmm. try and, and it, you could also say bls might say well i mean that's what the market's for right so that's why you have the commodities market on on wheat and corn and oil and all this um that gives you hour over hour <laughs> pricing information. Um, but it's not like a survey from a consumer standpoint, right? That's that's um, commodity dealers and traders saying, hey, if you want these goods, then we can arbitrage the, the variation within the smaller time intervals in order to um, uh, figure out uh, uh, in one viewpoint and figure out what the um, actual price should be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I yeah, I'm not sure that uh, I don't have any problem with publishing numbers. I, I'm because I think there are plenty of instances of hyperinflation without good price indexes. Like I don't think there are very good price indexes during uh, the uh, Weimar Republic, for instance, that I know of. Those maybe came after the fact, so that certainly wasn't driving it. But I just what I wish is that. There would be more focus on the disaggregate picture, just so that you can point out how non-uniform it is. So what, you can talk about inflation, but then you have to say, look, education, for instance, there's no inflation really to speak of. So why? Why is that? Um, these are important issues that I just. I find so often in economics, economics textbooks, especially macroeconomics, they focus on an aggregate picture. And I think my opinion is more often than not those aggregate pictures mislead. It misleads with GDP and I think it misleads with inflation. Um, not in the sense that there's a correct number that they should be using, that's not what I mean at all. I just mean that it's just not informative to to talk about averages um, like this because it just distracts from the fact that um, it's so all over the map. And when people see that, then they kind of realize, oh, that's not like the simple picture of inflation that I've been thinking about. Everything, all the prices are going up. It's just not how it works. Some prices are quite steady. Inflation also affects um, social standing. I mean, the people who barely have enough money to buy food and gasoline or transportation, obviously they're going to be, you know, 
when food's up 20%, but electronics are down 10%, you know, if you, if you're looking at aggregate, you're, you know, only 10%, but those people are paying, they don't buy electronics. So their actual cost expenditures are up 20% in real life, like childcare, you know, when childcare goes up, I mean, you know, we look at this CPI is really for a upper middle income kind of group of people. It really doesn't, you know, the people who don't make a lot of money really don't have the benefit of seeing, you know, Blair's chart is way more useful to them than it is to, you know, the, the government's chart, in my opinion. Yeah, you could argue, you could argue that the, or, or maybe uh, like some of the people who don't drive are not going to be affected as much by the huge uh, gasoline changes. Like I don't, I, my family doesn't really drive at all. And then so that, that whole part of it should just be clipped off uh, or, or like either me because I live at home or maybe people who let's say just take the bus uh, aren't affected by, by, you know, so maybe the poor actually aren't less affected in some ways because they don't, you know, they don't commute an hour every day by car uh, to a, a job an hour away. They just take the bus and then they're not as affected. So it could be, yeah, it could be all over the place depending on how, how you, what do you consume? Yeah, I, I believe the energy and transportation costs are uh, not on the CPI index. Um, You're right, they aren't. Well, some transportation, public transportation is, but public not. Transportation. Yeah. Um, yeah, but you know, and housing isn't either if you own your house. Mm -hmm. Rent is, but not, you know. Well, energy commodities are, that's the language they use, right? So not the raw, not oil, but the finished product would be yeah, the services, like your electricity bill, uh, heating yeah. bill. Yeah. Um, oops, sorry. A final question, maybe before we kind of start to wrap up or, or shift topic, maybe is um, I was wondering uh, what we think as a group do our price changes in general actually a good thing because if um, if price, if, 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 you know, it sort of, I guess, depends now. And I, and I, actually, this is a question maybe I have, I have for Blair is do we know to what extent prices are driven by power? Uh, can, we, can we quantify that? Or if we, if we can separate it out, um, you know, with this idea of restructuring, um, if price changes uh, potentially could be a good thing because they, they cause things to become more efficient. Um, how much of that is counter, you know, countered by by price changes uh, because of, of of powerful companies or groups uh, raising prices? Uh, and if, if and if it's a small amount, maybe price changes in net are actually a good thing. Um, I'm not sure. I think the honest answer is it has to be nobody really knows. Um, there's just. I, that's a I, that's a question that I actually get quite common is what to what degree does power affect pricing ability and it's just um, we re we really just don't know for one thing it's really difficult to to quantify power so kind of the, really the only metric that we have is size the size of a company however you want to quantify it maybe market cap or employment um and then you, all you have again is the aggregate pictures of the data that they are reporting so sales and profitability so it's just it's not enough data to answer the question that you're asking um so beyond really saying something really general that that in general the bigger the firm the more ability they have to set prices they're generally more profitable for one, and they, I think, are can raise prices more easily. Beyond that, there's not a lot you can say, I think, just because um, we, we just don't have the data. Um, and that's in part because that's hard data to get, but also because I think economists are not really interested in that picture from a policy angle. It doesn't fit with the, the textbook picture so it's just not a um, it's not popular research i have a uh, 
I don't want to derail things in the last five minutes, but I have a, I have a basic inflation question. Um, one of the things that I don't usually hear talked about is um, loans, like long-term loans, and how, um, like if I've got a 30-year mortgage, um, if there's a lot of inflation this year, my the price of my house just went down dramatically. Um, you know, my uh, all, all the rest of my payments for the next 30 years are just a lot lower. Um, does that take into account ever in like any any kind of adjustment or or policy or uh, oh, yeah, CPI? That, and yeah, that's, yeah that, that's that's really the monetary side, right? So you, you've got a thirty year mortgage. You have I would say a hundred thousand dollars down on the mortgage, but inflation puts you up ten percent. That's like being like reducing the the burden on your your income by or your your debt burden by ten percent there, right? Um, so However, the asset goes up, the value the of the asset, asset usually will go up while your debt yeah. on it decreases. Mm -hmm. But the question but is that the balance between creditors and debtors. Steve Keen has written about this. I mean, this is the idea of how do you get out of debt, um, um, like debt burdens. There's kind of two ways. Um, well, maybe three. You can grow your way out of it, so massive economic growth. You can uh, write off the debt, or you can inflate your way out of the debt. Um, so these are th people. Economists are know about this. Maybe not in newspapers, but in the literature, yeah, economists know about it. Definitely. I, I guess. Uh, I guess I was more asking, like, is there? Uh... A measurement of how people with mortgages don't suffer as much as people without. Like if I'm if I'm renting, uh, inflation is terrible. But if I'm owning, then it's actually pretty great. So, so it, it, that, I'm just pointing out a way that it affects different people differently. Sure. I I think I came across some some information about that they're thinking about adding mortgage costs to the CPI, if I'm not totally mistaken about that, because they currently include rent, but since there's a lot of people who own their homes, they're, they're thinking about somehow figuring out mortgage costs into it. I think they pulled actual home ownership out of that index in the oh, 70s, 80s somewhere, right? It was they, it, it was included at some, at some point and then they pulled it out. And I don't, I haven't heard that they were talking about re, you know, reintroducing it, but. Yeah, I can't remember where I came across that. Might, might have been, might have been the, the uh, yeah, the opposite. <laughs> That's interesting that, that it used to be part of it. Well, a side note is that home ownership is included in the national accounts for GDP. They impute the theoretical price that is not paid. But the theoretical price that a homeowner uh, pays to themselves for owning a house, kind of the equivalent category of rent. Um, so, oh, that's interesting. So, in in Switzerland, you actually have to pay tax on that. So, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's no no advantage to owning a home compared to renting because you have to pay a tax on the amount of rent you would have paid yourself. Hmm. Uh, um, as a, you income tax, there's no there's no um, like sales tax or something, but income tax. Reagan, did you want to ask anything before we wrap up? Thanks. Um, I was just typing in a question. I'm up on a roof, but uh, so I'll just finish typing it. And was for you, Claire. I was, if uh, just to get away from this wind, I'll type it in uh, quickly. All right. Thanks for joining us from the roof. <laughs> um, I did want to talk about uh, uh, economics sciences more generally. That was in the description as well, and uh, I think we might not get to it now. But um, in the while we wait for Reagan's question, maybe we can just quickly <laughs> have a quick discussion about that. Um, there, what do you? How do you? How do you? You, you maybe I will just say this. For those of you who haven't read anything else on Blair's blog, it's a really fantastic, and he takes um, uh, all sorts of economic topics and 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 puts a sometimes a very original spin on it that I haven't seen before, and I, I particularly like the recent post on on Vol the Voldemort uh, index, 
which is a, a kind of playful way to think about um, a power. But um, generally, how do you how do you evaluate the state of economics, and, and do, do you see any potential for improvement, Claire? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> I think there's a lot of interesting stuff going on on the fringes um, outside of academic. Like, I have no problem with people being interested in what I write about. That's um, people are very interested. So I think a lot of people are, are thinking about ways of um, changing economics within the academic system formally in, in economics departments, hardly anything has changed at all. So in that sense, there's like economics 101 hasn't changed for 50, 60 years. It's just the same thing, even though the material has been debunked uh, repeatedly by people like Steve King. And that just doesn't change anything. So in that sense, uh, not much is happening. Either. Maybe we should just, Reagan has a question here. Yeah. So his question is, could big oil's disproportionate share of collateral explain their increased share at higher prices. They have greater financial capacity and prospects waiting to be activated with expanding lending base of higher prices. Hmm. I don't know what you mean by collateral, but do you know what that means, Blair? No. Um... And the lending based on higher prices. I think maybe he's he's alluding to the um, the fact that their financing is tied to oil prices. Mm -hmm. um, so Reagan is actually an oil researcher, so he knows probably much more about this than I do. Um, I don't really have an answer to this question. Although in general, that's another thing that we didn't really talk about. That's another reason why big companies, um, I mean, they just have it easier getting finance for things. It's hard to relate that specifically to inflation. Nineteen seventies emergence of reserve based lending is a huge appreciated force in world economics. Hmm. Yeah, I gotta I have to sit plead ignorance here. I don't know that I have a, a good answer. Okay. Well, um I, uh, I I'll say let's uh, let's wrap it up formally here. We've reached the the, the time uh, cap uh, of the official event. I think I might be interested in in continuing the conversation a little bit after a brief break if anyone wants to stay on. But uh, I think we'll we'll conclude the formal part here, and uh, I'll thank everyone for coming, and I'll thank Blair for participating and, and taking part and sharing your thoughts. Um, this was very valuable. So. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Josh, for organizing.